welcome to an introduction to water resources management. Uh, my name is Leila Iman and I am a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Saskatchewan. This lecture consists of two parts. In the first part, we are going to find out uh, why we need to manage our water resources and how we can do it and what are the consequences of managing water resources. In the second part, we're going to talk about simulation and modeling of the water resources systems and how we can uh, use this uh, simulation uh, tool to help us better manage our water resources. Finally, we are going to uh, have a look at an application example to showcase the application of these simulating um, water resources uh, models. Let's start with finding out why we need to manage our water resources. When we look at Earth, we can see water everywhere. So why we need to manage water? Well, the fact is that from all water that we can see, only 2.5% is fresh water, meaning that the rest is salt water and not suitable for human usages like drinking or irrigating crops. Even from this 2.5% of fresh water, 69% is in the form of glaciers and ice caps, not easily accessible. 30% of this fresh water is in the form of groundwater, easier to access, but expensive because we need to, um, we need to use um, uh, um, pumping facilities and electricity to extract water from the deeper uh, layers underground. Only 1% of uh, this uh, fresh water um, is considered as easily accessible fresh water. And that is the water that mostly um, is available through rivers and lakes. Another reason that we need to manage our water resources is that this limited amount of water is not distributed across the world evenly. There are countries like Canada where uh, water is abundant versus countries like uh, North African countries with a very limited access to fresh water. Even in uh, many parts of the world, Temporal distribution of water resources and the availability of fresh water is not evenly um, considered evenly. So these parts, uh, in these parts, um, like many uh, semi-arid or uh, arid areas, um, seasonal rivers uh, have water in some uh, months in the year, but they are dry in some other months. So we, we see that the distribution of fresh water and its availability does not match our requirements. That's why we need to manage water resources to uh, actually match the distribution and availability of fresh water to uh, our demands for fresh water. Fresh water resources and water resources management is not something new to humans. Actually, humans started uh, managing water resources um, when they started uh, settling down around the sources of water to practice agriculture instead of hunting and gathering. Those days, uh, humans um, tried to make their homes and their farms as close as possible to the, um, to the sources of water to be able to grow their own food. But by um, uh, growing a population, it was not that easy to find a spot close to the uh, source of water to make a farm or a house. Also, Sometimes because of flooding events and some other natural disasters, it was even uh, dangerous to live that close to rivers and other, some other sources of water. So humans started to learn how to uh, build dams and how to um, store water in reservoirs when it was abundant, to use water when it was needed. The oldest known dam dated back to uh, almost 3000 BC. 
since those days, humans uh, continue to uh, to grow their communities and um, started to form um, cities and um, practice urbanized life lives. In those days, um, uh, humans developed uh, and and uh, construct urban water distribution systems and sewer systems to um, for their for their ancient cities. Uh, one of the examples um, um, have been found in uh, ancient Greek cities around, uh, dated back to around 2000 BC. And it was around those um, years that um, uh, he, uh, people started transferring water from where it originates to where it, uh, it can be used. Uh, so um, some examples uh, include um, Roman aqueducts, the elevated aqueduct, the elevated ducts or pathways to transfer water from mountains to Roman cities, um, or uh, some uh, other underground pathways to convey water um, invented by people in ancient Persia uh, called Kanat, uh, which was designed to um, transfer water from, um, from uh, mountainous aquifers to the plains where people lived. Also, people learned how to um, divert uh, water from rivers uh, to use it uh, and to irrigate their farms and how to control flood. So one of the um, oldest irrigation and flood control systems uh, is uh, found in China uh, around 256 BC and it's uh, still uh, working nowadays. So you can see that the history of water resources management is not uh, separated from the history of human civilization. And um, it, will, it is somehow um, um, entangled with, with uh, human civilization. Now, if we want to uh, categorize water management uh, strategies, we can consider two main categories, structural and non-structural strategies. An example of uh, structural strategies um, is uh, reservoir construction. So we build a dam to uh, form a reservoir and to uh, store water uh, when it's um, abundant uh, and use it when we need it. Also, uh, we can transfer water from, let's say, mountains when it is originate, originated uh, to, to cities where we need to use it. Uh, there are other structural uh, strategies like uh, recycling or treatment of uh, uh, used or pollutant water. And uh, that used to be mainly the case for uh, industries uh, that do not um, need high quality fresh water for their uh, production. But nowadays, uh, researchers are um, finding and working on methods uh, to, to um, uh, recycle and to treat uh, uh, pollutant water to the degree that is suitable even for uh, drinking purposes. Non-structural strategies, on the other hand, are mainly focused on managing uh, water uh, demand or water uh, allocation. How can we manage uh, water demand? Well, uh, take uh, a farm as an example. In a farm where uh, crop types are um, highly water demanding, we um, have a high demand for water. But if we replace those crop types with, with, with some other uh, types of crops uh, that require less water, or even if we uh, replace uh, the um, uh, crop high, uh, highly water demanding crops with another variety of the same type, but with lower water demands, we can uh, reduce the, uh, the total amount of water requirement for that um, farm. So you can see that this is one of the ways that we can manage our demand for water. Also, we can manage uh, the way that we allocate water. So um, if we reduce water um, that is allocated to one sector, and pass that water to another sector that can generate more economic benefit using the same amount of water, we are almost managing our uh, water allocation. And there are so many other examples. 
And as you may have noticed, uh, this, uh, these examples uh, under both categories uh, are mainly focused on quantitative management of water resources. Whereas there are so many other examples of other ways of managing water resources uh, associated with other issues uh, that we uh, face, like flood control or uh, water quality management. For the sake of time and to keep it simple, here I'm focusing on water, uh, on a quantitative management of water resources. When we uh, manage our water resources, actually we are changing uh, the natural system to match um, the timing uh, and uh, the amount of uh, available water to our requirements. Whatever change that we make to the natural system has some consequences. So let's see how we impact uh, the water system when we try to manage uh, um, these systems. One uh, major change that we usually make to the uh, water systems um, is uh, changing their quantity and uh, flow regime. Take a river um, before being um, uh, changed by humans as an example. And perhaps this river um, has a, a monthly distribution, flow distribution, um, like what you can see on the screen right now, in, uh, shown in a black dotted line. This, is, uh, this uh, graph is based on um, observ ob observed data uh, for the South Saskatchewan River uh, at Saskatoon uh, here in Canada, the city that I'm living now. Now imagine that humans find this river and uh, they uh, like it and they want to settle um, down around this river. So they start to make their homes, um, start to um, uh, practice agriculture, cultivate their crops and um, raise their, their livestock. Uh, and also they establish their, their factories uh, all around the river to supply water to all these demands and all these different users they uh, need to build a dam uh, on the river to uh, store water in the reservoir behind the dam and now if you uh, look at the uh, monthly distribution of this river the same river but after the um, construction of the dam you can see that the the quantity and flow regime um, uh, changes dramatically. So the peak flow that uh, used to occur around June um, to all, uh, at the level of almost 800 uh, cubic meters per second now drops down to almost 300 cubic uh, meters per second. So this is one way that we, that we impact uh, the, the natural uh, system when we try to manage uh, water resources. Also, apart from this quantitative impact, uh, we may degrade the quality of water resources. And a very simple of that, a simple example of that is uh, when we extract water from a river, for example, and then um, uh, use it for to irrigate our uh, lands, uh, and at the same time use uh, fertilizers and um, pesticides in general chemicals uh, and then which which is mixed with the water and then return that pollutant water to the to the river so we are uh, we are degrading the quality of uh, the river by um, discharging these pollutants um, um, efflows into the uh, into the river so uh, this is dangerous in the sense that um, we might reach to the, to the point uh, where the water in this river is not, uh, um, is not suitable for, uh, for, using, uh, for, for um, human usages like drinking or irrigation anymore because of the high level of contaminants in it. So, um, as discussed, um, our uh, different man water management strategies uh, have um, consequences uh, on, on the environment and on other users. 
That's why it's uh, finding the best way to manage our water resources is not always an easy task. Um, basically, because a strategy that might be beneficial to one group of users might even be harmful to another group. For example, if we have a simple hypothetical um, uh, river uh, basin with two regions, an upstream region uh, uh, on the left and uh, a downstream region on the uh, right, uh, with different users in both regions uh, withdrawing water from this river. If the upstream people decide to build a dam on this river to supply more water to, for their um, requirements, this alter the um, river flow towards downstream region and consequently reduces the amount of uh, water that could be supplied to different users in downstream areas. This way, the same decision, which is constructing the dam, that benefits the upstream user, users is harmful to downstream users. So upstream users receive more water and produce more production and economic output and um, receive um, more um, economic benefits. Whereas uh, downstream um, users receive less water and probably they, um, uh, they can produce less output because of that uh, reduction in the amount of water that they receive. And that causes uh, an economic loss in downstream uh, industries. So this may uh, rise a conflict uh, between the two regions and, and different users in different parts of this river basin. So that is why if we want to find um, uh, the most effective and efficient water management policy or plan, we need to consider some, um, some uh, specific steps. So first, we need to uh, carefully study the conditions of our water system and try to know the different uh, parts of the system clearly as, uh, as much as possible. Then we need to understand the potential consequences of alternative water management uh, strategies and plans. And finally, uh, we need to involve stakeholders as much as possible in our uh, decision-making process. So in the example that I just uh, uh, talked about in the previous uh, slide, uh, before constructing that dam, uh, we, um, we need to uh, include uh, stakeholders from downstream as well as upstream regions to discuss the benefits of uh, this dam construction um, and uh, the impacts of this dam construction uh, on, their, um, on their lives and on their um, um, uh, even health so that we can come up with an, ag with an agreement uh, between the two regions um, about constructing a dam that uh, benefits uh, both groups and um, is uh, least harmful uh, to, to um, either parties. So with this, I would like to stop here and uh, we will continue with uh, a second part talking about the simulation and um, modeling of water resource systems and how we can use it as a tool to help us understand the consequences of different water uh, allocation and water um, management um, decisions, as well as other external drivers that may change uh, to um, uh, water systems and how we can use it uh, to help us better manage uh, our water resources. Um, so uh, let's continue uh, in the second part.